not dealing with AT and T. You're 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 not dealing with AT&T. 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 All right, we are back. Today, we have my friend and collaborator, Keith Michael, on the show, and we're glitching the sci-fi classic, Flash Gordon. Uh, And Keith is a comedian and musician who makes sound art under the moniker Local Host Not Found and is part of the comedy variety show, Zark TV. So, Keith, how are you doing? Very well, thanks. How are you? Doing great, yeah. So what is your kind of relationship with Flash Gordon, and why did you want to see it glitched on the show today? Well, Flash Gordon is a great movie, uh, and and the soundtrack is great. I think we can all agree on that. Um, There are so many great things about it. Uh, Many of the samples that... um, we used we as in one plus one the the two member group that my friend carlos and i came up with uh, we use a lot of flash gordon samples in our uh output (laughs) and uh, it it it's just i don't know as kids growing up i mean uh, it was it was it's a cheesy sci-fi movie that you can laugh at but you still love to sing the songs so uh, that's why I chose it, and uh, you know we, we do use heavily samples from Flash Gordon. Yeah, and we're actually planning on making a collaborative video that I'll have coming out the same time of uh, One Plus One God Slot Machine. So I guess that kind of transitions into our next question of how did you get started with music? Um, you talk about Local Host Not Found, and also... Uh, one plus one and how did that uh, kind of so you have your solo stuff and then you have this collaboration stuff and how did that get started yeah 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 sorry I uh, wasn't very organized uh, with with what I said there but uh, yeah so I I'm, I don't have any music uh, aside from one class in college electronic music uh, intro to electronic music class at Ramapo College aside from that one class which really taught me nothing I, I have no training in music at all. I, uh, like everyone else, love music. But uh, when I got into college, that was 1994, I met my friend Carlos. And I, I quickly became involved in the radio station. Uh, that was WRPW. It was an AM station at Pace University. I walked in there loving industrial music and uh, heavy metal. And I guess I left that radio station, you know, uh, loving electronic music. And that all happened within a year. Uh, I had a lot, I met a lot of friends at that radio station, Carlos included. And uh, I discovered then, 1994, uh, New Order, Erasure, Depeche Mode. I mean, I've heard of these bands, but never really listened to them. And I started to fall in love with them. And, and also at the same time, techno and a lot of electronic dance music at raves. That was all happening, and that was something in college that I, I, I went to, and I, and I did. So I quickly latched on to the Orb, and they are probably my favorite group of all time. Uh, at the, I, I think Adventures Beyond the Ultra World was one of my favorite uh, CDs 
along with uh, the Orb Live 93, which I think was at Woodstock. So, I, I guess the reason why I like the Orb so much was because there's so much electronic music at the time. I just didn't even understand. I was so new to it. And I... I didn't really even know how to dance, so, uh, you know, I'd go to clubs and stuff at Limelight and, and all these other places, and, um, you know, I, I just, I felt awkward and didn't understand the music so much, but the Orb and Orbital, they all, that, that was very approachable to me. They, they heavily use samples, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And especially the orb, they, they like to layer a lot of sounds and, and create sort of an architecture or an atmosphere. And I mean, I'm not saying it means anything or there's any kind of interpretation you can take out of it, but it just sounded really cool, especially when you got hot. So <laughs> on weed. So uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's sort of uh, how I got into electronic music and everything came from the orb. Carlos, um, he worked with uh, a lot of music uh, before. I think he, he's pretty good on the keyboard. Um, he, ha he had a lot of experience with these raves and uh, a lot of the music that was going on. So he, I always look, I still look up to him and I always will. Um, he, he really helped uh, cultivate the <laughs> appreciation I have for electronic music. So when I met him, um, uh, that's when the two of us, so uh, I, I failed out of Pace University because I, I partied way too much. Um, that's where I met Carlos. And uh, we've been friends, we're still friends. And, and so after I failed out of Pace, uh, I would still come to hang out with him. He lived in the Bronx and I would lug my computer over there and my monitor. Back then, monitors were super heavy. And I would lug all my, uh, he'd have a mixer and uh, his computer and monitor. I'd have my computer and monitor, and then we'd probably have like a third item. And um, we would record to cassette tape. And uh, we were just trying to imitate the orb. Um, in fact, at first, we would just take the orbs, uh, the song, I think it's called the, it's a really long song title, the... Uh, something beyond the center of the ultra, uh, the ultra world, and and but they had the mini Ribbleton "Loving You" uh, uh, sampled in that song heavily, and that was one of our favorites. So we would we would basically take various remixes of that song and just live and record it to a cassette. Uh, that that song playing and fade in and out parts of the song. Um, to like come up with a new creation <laughs> of loving you, uh, and that's kind of how we got started. That's so cool. Especially, the, do you have any of the old uh, tape recordings, or have they all we, kind of converted to digital at this point? So yeah, I still have a shoebox full of cassette tapes and mini discs. So uh, mini discs became pretty big. I think, well, not they were never big, but. They came out around, um, I don't know, the ni late 90s, I guess, we started using them. And fortunately, well, I wish we had dad tapes. We, we couldn't afford that stuff. But um, fortunately, we had mini discs. So a lot of our stuff, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the Loving You stuff. But a lot of our stuff since then had been dumped to mini disc, which is a, di it's digital, but it's still compressed. Um, to, to fit on the size of a very small CD, but the quality is fairly good, and uh, we've been able to uh, recover a lot of that stuff um, and, and, and record it into a WAV file on the computer, and, and now, if we wanted to, we could, we could really start to mess around with it, but most of the, the, the way we would approach making music wasn't ever, let's make a song. It was okay, let's just jam. So we'd connect the stuff together, we would record the entire night for like three hours, and we would just play lots and lots of noises. And then we would listen back for days to it. <laughs> and then sometimes we would, you know, occasionally, sometimes, we would find, you know, anywhere from three to 15 minutes of material that wasn't too bad. And so we would just clip that out 
and then call it a song. Uh, and that's basically how uh, God Slot Machine was was born. That's great. I love the uh, the improvisational aspect of it, and then the yeah the curation after the fact of you know um, putting together all this stuff and then then cutting out what what works and what doesn't. Um, yep. But the it kind of reminds me. Um, I'm sure this analogy has been made before of but just kind of improvisational music and um and painting and art like that where i mean in some aspects of painting and drawing you have you know a very set plan of you know which you can approach music that way too of of just like this is the structure of the face this is the structure of the nose but the more kind of abstract expressionism and just yeah improvising and then building on those improvisations um it, it, it's funny you mention that because at the uh, i do actually have uh, an art uh, background in college you know after i went to pace and failed out uh, accounting i studied accounting which was a terrible thing it's what my dad my dad did so uh, i failed out and now I'm at a state school, a uh, state college, Rampo College, and I decided I'm going to become a graphic designer, uh, even though, you know, I never ever considered myself to be an artist. This all happened around the same time that the music popped up, and the the music that I would make again, it, I, because I had no history, I felt samples and and uh, uh, using computer software, which is all I had you know, kind of led to my uh, weakness of not having any training. And in the same way, I think about art. So I had to take art classes um, in college. And I'll tell you, out of all the, the classes, space included, the art classes were the toughest because although I failed out of pace, uh, it's because I really didn't try. If I just went to class, I could, I could usually pass a class by coasting. Uh, art classes are the only classes I found in college that I could not coast through. If I put in, if you needed to put in 12 hours of work and I put in two, which was normally my approach to most college things, uh, you could tell immediately. And you could tell the people who put in 12 hours and you could tell the people who put in 24. And so the art I started to focus on at that time was abstract art, especially in America after 1940 where you had uh, Jasper Johns and Clifford Stills and Clifford Stills I think that's his name right you know so th that I related to because I felt it was so you know it, um, even Dada art and, and, and I, I, I felt it was so approachable <laughs> for me especially since I, I couldn't really paint um, and I loved it because what am I 19 or you know, 19 years old? I'm still a teenager, uh, truly. Um, I was for a long time, and and this I w when I learned about this art, I learned that it was a reactionary and and uh, you know it was anti-establishment, and that th these are cool things to someone who's young and impressionable. Um, so. I love studying that stuff in college, and yeah, so I relate to what you're talking about with the ex uh, expressionist art, uh, ab abstract expressionist art. I, I think uh, it's definitely my favorite and the, the one I'm most knowledgeable about because of those classes. That's awesome. I didn't know about your uh, visual art background as well. That's awesome. Do you still do yeah. any kind of uh, uh, painting or, or design stuff too? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I took graphic design as a shortcut. Uh, at the time in college, there weren't a lot of classes for web design. I felt I wanted to be a web designer. I graduated in 99, uh, right before the dot-com bubble burst. And uh, the problem was I kind of never, I never, I was never confident enough in my design skills. And even when I did something, they were just kind of technically and boring. Never risky uh, but part of that had to do with the technical aspects that I learned so uh, my affinity with computers is much is much greater and uh, especially with, when it came to coding and 
I found it easier for me to make the websites than it was to design them. And mm -hmm. so I kind of, uh, at the time, I, I, I went more into a programming role. And uh, the, the title I kind of had at, at that point, this was 2000, was in, uh, oh, I forget, Design Architect. Uh, I was in a liaison between the heavy programmers and the designers, and I had to kind of make them work together. It was, uh, it was tough, but that only lasted a year because by 2001 I had quit, and uh, I started to work for a law firm just to, to make some money um, as an IT person, and uh, sa sadly, that's been my career since. It's been rewarding financially, um, but uh, creatively, it's, it's, uh, it's been a burden uh, up until uh, COVID which is when I, I I started to feel the itch again to, to work on some things. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about music, talked about visual art. Where did you kind of get your start with comedy? Yep, that was, um, that was right around COVID. So <clears throat> without really having, uh, <laughs> not feeling confident in any other area, and, and a long time has passed, uh, well, comedy, again, I like music, so who doesn't like comedy? Uh, comedy is great. Uh, I, I find it easier to, uh, when I meet new people, and it's a bad habit of mine, but I tend to try to be funny just to uh, make myself at ease, perhaps, and make people laugh. It's just something I've done yeah. my whole life. And, uh, yeah, right or wrong. I, uh, but I, Yeah, you know, I definitely... True. Yeah, that's very relatable because I feel like I do the same thing, especially with with meeting new people. And it's one, uh, just a way to to, to re relate to people. If you you know you can make them laugh, but then two, it's like I'm trying to make myself laugh too. So it's yeah, make, yeah. making jokes and you know making comments on on. I don't know. It's yeah, one of I my don't know uh... if it's just like inherently human or if the if yeah, certain people some are people drawn to it, it more. When I was, uh, a funny side note, when I was dating my, my now wife, and uh, I had to meet her sister and her sister's boyfriend, we went to Olive Garden. And as my uh, sister and her boyfriend at the time, they, they were sitting down already, so my wife and I are walking in, and just as we walk, and I, I, by the way, I'm so nervous because I'm dating this, this beautiful woman, and I'm about to sit down with her family, you know, that's, that's nerve-wracking. So a woman walks by crying, um, and the waitress is chasing her out. And I overhear, like, I saw my husband. She, she, the woman saw her husband with another person at the restaurant. She had come there, saw the husband, and uh, and ran out crying. And of course, many people saw this, including Wendy's sister and her boyfriend. So I'm still so nervous. And the first thing I say is, I sit down, Olive Garden. When you're here, you see your family, and it it, <laughs> uh, it just kind of goes to show you, <laughs> like you know, I'll I'll pick up on it. Like what? A, I mean, what a terrible thing for that woman uh, to yeah. experience. Uh, and then I make a little joke about it, and it it I guess it goes to show you where my my mind goes. It's it can be a little dark with comedy, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, all my life. But as a as a high school kid. Uh, before college, I was into filmmaking. Uh, I never had a camcorder. A family, uh, they were very expensive, didn't have it, but a friend did. We would make so many skits on the camera. Um, they were legendary to all of us uh, in high school. Uh, of course, they're probably all gone now, but uh, you know, that, that's where we started to make a lot of films, and, or films, uh, bits, um, and they're, they're countless. Yes, 
I guess that, that leads perfectly into uh, Zark TV. So you have this relationship with comedy going all the way back to, to high school, you said you were making skit and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I stopped after high school, but uh, resumed. Yeah, in my typical fashion, I, I wait 20 years and reset. Yeah. yeah. So for the uninitiated, what is Zark TV? Okay, so it's it's just a silly uh, show, and the format is uh, little tiny bits. It, it, it pretends to be a network uh, television station. So UHF is kind of a, an inspiration in many ways. Uh, it, it pretends to be a, a silly television station, a network, and uh, there are little bits that go through. One of my favorite moves is to like make a bit that doesn't end and the channel changes and when the channel changes there's a brief uh, moment of static and, and then something else happens and it, it's really for the short attention span uh, society we live in today where everything is trickled down to 60 seconds or less and, and put on TikTok or, or Twitter mm -hmm. and so it's really hard to get the attention span of anyone for 30 or 60 minutes um, maybe your your friend would like to watch uh, a show, but the moment she finds out it's you know 30 minutes long, she's lost. She, she's lost. Uh, but if you just send her a 60 second thing and she likes it, um, you know she, she maybe she'll seek out others. So uh, and 
I'm not the first to realize this, of course, um, but uh, we, we like that format and, and it, it gives us a lot of creativity to, to just make something very funny and silly. And so all these bits are surrounded by a story uh, that takes place over a season. Uh, so, uh, and this season we're doing eight episodes. We have two left. Um, and so uh, the story itself in between the bits, it's you know supposed to be funny too. And uh, hopefully people find it fun. So two of my favorite bits on it that you do, one is uh, Bass Boys, which I kind of interpret as like a, a funny parody of uh, masculinity and relationship with nature and it the first one i saw was yeah that like you i think you're going camping or something you're like hey this is my first episode of bass boys <laughs> it's, it's yeah. going fishing. <laughs> and yeah, 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 yeah. the video <laughs> and, and bass boys hey guys keith michael here and i am ready for some bass uh fishing i have my lure my weight and my rod all set to go. This is a pilot episode of Bass Boys. The show is about middle-aged men who reclaim their manhood through fishing for the first time. And I am all set. I'm here in the Poconos at the lake house of my wife's family. And there's a lot of fishing equipment here and I figure this is a great place to kind of figure out what it's like to be a man and be a fisherman all at the same time. And as you can see, my rod is ready. It's a perfect cast. Nothing, nothing yet. Um, but as you can see, I'm a master fisherman and I do know how to use these antiques. Look at that cast. I think I got something. Oh, he got away. He got away. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. It, I, I don't know how to put it in word other than it's just like, I don't know, it's this funny thing of just we have this kind of um, feeling towards nature and wilderness. And then it's there's just some comedic gold about like us trying to reclaim it. And I <laughs> saw a meme today that I actually sent to one of our Twitter group chats of that it just because it reminded me so much of uh bass boys though it's like podcasts i'd rather be casting my line <laughs> <laughs> and that just the, like reminds me so much of bass boys one of the uh funny things about shooting that was uh, first uh, it was from last summer uh i was making a joke i didn't do anything with it and uh but uh, you know someone had reminded me i made it so i, I found i it took a long time i found the footage and i recalled a bunch of things so uh one of the jokes i like to say you know, like this so remember it's about a, a man like having his masculinity and, and one of the first things i say is like this is my wife's uh father's house you know so i'm, <laughs> I'm there and i'm like raiding his fishing area and uh I pick up this pole and I look at it. I'm like, this pole's in my mind off the camera. I'm like, this pole's really short. I'm like, I, I don't know. Maybe it's a kid's pole, but I find it funny to use this short pole. I find out well after recording, no, Keith, uh, that's an ice fishing pole and you're using it in May out in June. And uh, <laughs> I thought that was, that was really. Yeah. There's all these yeah, jokes but, that I didn't even pick up on since I, since I'm not a fisher. And same here. I, I, first of all, I wouldn't, I mean, I fished as a kid in the Boy Scouts. Uh, I, all I ever caught was, uh, uh, I think what they call, I don't know what you call them out here. They're not, uh, sunfish. Uh, we call them out here sunfish. They're there. You throw them back. And, uh, whenever I caught, first of all, I didn't like putting the worm on the hook. It's, it's, you hear a squish is, it's just, I don't like 
I don't like harming things intentionally. I feel like I'm harming a worm intentionally doing that. And then whenever you get the fish, all I wonder about, like if you throw it back, like how did you mess up his mouth? Like is he going to like gobble up like food in the, in the, in the pond forever just in pain? <laughs> it's like pain. And I don't care what Kurt Cobain said, you know, it, a fish – you know, they, they probably feel pain. Uh, so I wouldn't even know what to do if I accidentally caught a fish. Um, I mean, I, I would, I, I know how to take the hook out and, and all that, but uh, I wouldn't know how to, how to eat it. I would just have to throw it back. So uh, it just seems like a silly hobby to me. Uh, yeah, I definitely. <laughs> I could drink beer anywhere. I don't need to be fishing with you. Yeah. I like it in Animal Crossing and I have like, one very good memory of fishing that turned into to, like I remembered Boy Scout camp fishing and enjoying it, never really catching much. And but yeah, it's the the being out in nature. And then I remember going fishing with my uncle, and it was such like a great time. It was so wonderful outside yeah. and on the boat. And then, but I remember like they just he just wanted to throw back the fish, and I was like, oh no, we should keep them because we should eat them, you know. Like, and uh, so I convinced them that we should keep him keep the fish to eat uh but you know i was a little kid and i didn't know all that went into it so then when we got back to my grandpa's house then is like oh we kept these fish like well you kept it like we're gonna have to to clean it to eat it and i just remember him like cleaning the fish like in front of me outside and just being like horrified that like after the head was cut off the the gill is like still moving and just oh oh, yeah I, yeah, yeah it bring it back totally memories. Right. I have the same ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think I've tasted it now that I now that I'm going back. I, I've I've had it, and it you know they fried it, and it was gross. Yeah, I, I would I, eat, I, I would rather eat acorns. I, I, I could not I could not eat that particular fish. Like I do, I you know maybe I should become a vegan at some point. I do still same, partake yeah. in in meat and fish and have that kind of. Um, Cognitive yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and like yeah. separation from like I'm not the the butcher of it, but I do wonder if there is that because I know, I think it, is it Michael Pollan who wrote Omnivore's Dilemma? I oh, think I it's Michael the jungle, Pollan. Jungle. Oh yeah, so Omnivore's Dilemma goes through kind of it's all about the food industry. It's like a more modern book, but there's one chapter of it where he talks about like killing and eating his own like food. Uh, cause he goes through all these different kind of experiences with food and the industry yeah. and talks about, uh, there's this like weird spiritual aspect to it. And he was like, I probably would never do it again. But like, I think, I don't know if it's a boar or like a wild hog or something. I couldn't do that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have an enemy too. Uh, it's, it's, you know, my dog attacked a chipmunk, uh, just two weeks ago. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to describe it, but, um, the, it lived and I had to, to, but it was fatally wounded and I had to terminate it. And it was, uh, it was upsetting. It's just upsetting. It's just a little chipmunk, but uh, I didn't like it. So let's talk about happy stuff. again. All right. Going on to happy stuff. The other skit, uh, one bit I really enjoy is the hunting numbers and the kind of, so it's, it's a, like a kind of fake podcast about, is it, a, it's a call-in show? Um, it, it was a podcast that the last episode, I, I pretend to take calls. Uh, it's so at that point, you know, it's still not a live call-in show. I think that was part of me know being funny um nobody called in live i kept uh get playing a sound that people were pranking me uh, <laughs> i do have an interview uh with uh, someone and i've had it in my pocket now for several months i just have to uh finish writing the sixth episode but uh yeah it's a it's a bit it well it's so funny because it's like you're you know you're you're trying to come up with this uh the right number and you have this whole cosmology behind numbers and it reminds me of the people who you know like oh like i keep seeing 777 everywhere like i paid for something and after tax it was seven dollars and 77 cents this must be an angel number my seven spirit son of the seven son me uh, but <laughs> yes. you take it to this like kind of ridiculous extreme 
of being like there are some numbers that are angel numbers and some numbers that are demon numbers and just, yeah. just seeing what's a good number and a bad number but then also the bit and i've not heard you describe it this way of like you're trying to like put the listener under every time because it's just like <laughs> so so that was a funny bit i i wrote um for a long time i actually listened to these deep sleep um meditation uh, things you know to, to help me fall asleep easy mm-hmm. and it, i mean it works um so while you have to understand that i i, I write outlines on on the shows but that's about 40 or 50 percent of it a lot of it is improv so as i'm going through it and that's really the only thing i'm good at my writing i don't i don't, I don't like to write too much i, I like to just write enough and then improv the rest so it that suddenly came to me uh after i think after i asked people to subscribe you know for ten thousand dollars a month uh i i say um and you know came to me i'm like let me try to put them under so that was my best attempt at recalling how to put someone under basically i was listening to those tapes and uh you know, if I if I took it seriously, I, I think I could actually put people under, uh, because I would just basically say the same thing uh, that, that the tapes had had said. I, I have it almost committed to memory, but uh, yeah, that was a bit. And then I, I think I said, "Give me a dollar a month uh, when I put people under," and um, <laughs> I, I I still have not made a dollar yet, so I, I don't think I, I'm very I, successful. Yeah, I do wonder about that too, because I've used those, uh, you know, falling asleep. Uh, deep sleep money meditation like it's gonna yeah, yeah, yeah. you're gonna wake up rich and uh, a foot yeah, taller the yeah. secret, you're gonna wake up and, and be able to <laughs> amass great amounts of wealth but I do wonder if it is almost like this form of hypnotism where they are putting you under or in that like hypnagogic state in between sleep and dream if there's some sort of nefarious like you must subscribe to my YouTube channel <laughs> like, well and you, there, when, <laughs> yeah there could be and that concerned me. Uh, I, I had talked to an aunt who suggested that actually, and so I did listen to the uh, twenty. It's only a twenty-minute thing, you know, th- that I was using. Mm-hmm. I listened fully, so I recorded it and I listened to it fully awake and uh, intentionally. You know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, there's nothing going on. It's just basically saying. If you, um, they're not using any kind of technology. They're just layering over yeah, nice things like you will get a good sleep. You will have a pleasant dream. You will wake up fully refreshed. And it, it's like four different voices all at once. You know, by that time, you're already asleep. Yeah. Uh, but uh, okay. I don't listen that's, to them anymore. That's good, that yeah. particular one. Oh, <laughs> well, that yeah. one I had, yeah. Um, I, if you did make a longer episode of, or I guess I could put all the episodes together of, uh, of hunting numbers and use it to, to fall asleep. Cause it'd be nice to, yeah, have you kind of re you know, be, be my narrator and to sleep. I do use, I do use podcasts, um, a lot, but then it's even with comedy ones too, it's like occasionally you'll get a character who's yelling or something where doesn't quite will you know wake you up or you'll get in that half sleep i've had that a lot happen falling asleep to like comedy bang bang or something where you're kind of in that half sleep state and you can definitely feel the the podcast is is um kind of interfering with your dreams a little bit and yeah. and sometimes it, can, it works it can change it yeah you know the, the characters are so goofy uh, and then other times it's just like, you know, I wish I kind of wonder what my actual dreams would be if I didn't have that kind of input into it. I stopped uh, using when I was younger, I had a TV in the bedroom and TV would be on all night. Um, and then I would listen to a deep sleep meditation thing or rain noise. The only thing I, I keep on now is brown noise in the bedroom it uh helps uh, it helps me go to sleep easier if i wake up in the middle of the night but i i, I stop putting things on because all i i do feel that all of that i'm not a scientist but all of that really will disrupt and and i found the dream thing you're talking about 
you know, like when the TV was on, I'm half dreaming, half awake. Yeah. And, you know, the TV just kind of, what I would hear on the TV would just kind of mess around. I don't know. I'm, I'm at the age now where I, I want a fully peaceful sleep. I don't want to mess around. <laughs> so I just have noise. I'd... Yeah, I should try brown noise because I knew I if I'm really having trouble to sleep or because I can never put on like a podcast that I'm too interested in. Right. Um, because it's then it'll draw me in. Uh, and yeah. rain sounds too if it, if especially if there's if there's something noisy that's interfering with me sleeping or if I'm just like really have insomnia I'll put on like heavy um, heavy rain sounds but I should try try brown noise I do think the best is, is when I don't need anything but I'll use the timer on podcasts too helps a lot because then it's like I know it'll shut off after you know 15 or yeah 30 but then minutes. I would wake up yeah and that's that's the other warning I'm going to give you now with the brown noise it's great uh, it's rare the power goes out in the middle of the night. And I have battery backups on some things, but the speaker that plays brown noise, there's no battery backup. So when the power goes out, let me tell you something. That brown noise goes out no matter what time, you're waking right up. Somehow your brain knows <laughs> that it's suddenly yeah. silent in the room and you will you will wake up. Uh, that's kind of cool, uh, I guess. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> you can almost set it as an alarm clock of uh, <laughs> you could time it for when you want to wake up. Yeah, and yeah, just, just wake up. Right out alarm, just the brown noise cuts out. So with uh, with Zark TV, with your music, with um, just kind of everything that you've started doing creatively again since the pandemic, where where do you kind of draw inspiration from? I know that's kind of a broad question. Yeah, no, I uh, right. So most of my friends are are <laughs> actually responsible for that. Um, and you know, when I say friends, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you and, and, uh, uh, 
you, our friends, our mutual friends, uh, the, the people I'm working with, Zarkat, uh, they are all uh, similar to, in, in that they want to uh, laugh, they want to, uh, especially with the comedy stuff, they all want to laugh uh, and have a good time. And I think a lot of the, all the inspiration I get is, is from like minded people. It, 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 it makes me want to uh, create more. Making my friends laugh is something I, I like to do, and uh, yeah, that's really it. You know, and then of course there are some great TV shows out there. Uh, I, I love uh, Tim Robinson's "I Think You Should Leave." Uh, that that show is absolutely fantastic, and the new Kids in the Hall season. I've already devoured that one, so I'm gonna watch it again. As a child, they. That, that was comedy to me. It was on HBO. They had bad words, and they were funny as hell. And um, you know, to see them back again this year has been great. Yeah, I need. To, I haven't watched the new uh, new Kids in the Hall. I have to check that out. Um, Definitely. Where do you see your kind of self? Where do you see yourself going next with uh, with music? Um, you said Zark TV's. Uh, season one is about to finish up. What's kind of the plan for for season two and beyond? Sure. So season one, yeah, we have our seventh episode. We'll be recording this week. Uh, it'll play next week, I believe, on the thirteenth. Uh, so uh, we'll be wrapping that up after eight episodes. We'll probably take a few months off to record some more material and brainstorm ways to uh, improve it and, and and come back you know it's season there's always another season to make so uh, look forward to that musically I, I've been kind of stagnant I, I've uh, I need to figure out new ways to, to use the software I have I have a lot of software most of it I don't know how to use and I'm still stuck in a lot of my old uh, my old process which is ancient and uh you know th there's there's some new things i need to learn in order to uh focus uh, in in work with music but um hopefully i'll be able to to do that soon anything you want to uh plug obviously zark tv local it's not found one plus one uh yeah anything else you want to leave the and all the links will be in the show notes as well. Anything yep. else you want to leave the viewers with? No, that that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Sid, you have, uh, you're, you're, you're really helped inspire, um, a lot of the stuff I, I've been working on. Uh, it, it's, it's great knowing you and, uh, I really, really enjoy working with you on, on projects. So, Thanks so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. It's always fun to talk about a song I made 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, go, All right, go through those tapes and you'll find another another song <laughs> and Hopefully. digitize it and we'll, we'll have you on again soon. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, adios.